Hello, Seattle voters. My name is Ian Ackwick Ash, born May 8th, 1991, and I'll be running for 2017's election for Seattle City Council, position number nine at large. I'm running a campaign a bit differently. I won't be advertising. There's no frills. This isn't for profit, and I don't want to intrude on your daily life. I won't be editing these daily video blogs, just uploading the best version I record. Some of the other campaigns will hire editors to fix up their videos. They're more afraid to be genuine. This is a channel for the viewer and not for the views. Some of the topics I'll be covering in the weeks to come are homelessness, density, transportation, neighborhood planning, advertisement, sports arenas, luxury, efficiency, and recent news. Today, I'd like to talk about some pretty dark things. The first one is the shooting of Miss Charlena Lyles, which occurred on June 18th of 2017. What I'd like to ask are, where were the non-lethal options, and why did the officer decide to enter, given the prior history of Miss Lyles' relationship with the police? Now, this stems from information I've read everywhere, primarily the Seattle Times, in their issue on June 24th. Officer Anderson noted when he arrived that there was an officer warning in his computer. Police had reported an earlier incident with Lyles on June 5th, in where she allegedly trapped the officers, preventing them from leaving, and threatened them with garden shears, or some other type of large scissor. The police drew their guns to force her to put the shears away. When he entered, he thought he didn't need his taser. He had left it in his locker. It was not charged. The battery was not working. When an officer is issued a taser, they're expected to carry it with them and keep it in good operating condition. This should be standard protocol. But where were his other non-lethal options? Uh, Officers Anderson and McNew shot Charlena Lyles when she threatened them with two knives in her kitchen. Now, there are other ways to take down an armed assailant, ways that should be available to our law enforcement officers. Things like body armor, pepper spray, or a baton could have been an excellent preventative measure to avoid combat with a knife-armed individual. Instead, the officer called for a taser, not having one, and Charlena was not tased, but instead shot when she refused to back down and lower her weapons. The video recording of this event is not available. The video recording of her apartment showing that no one had entered or exited that video in the hours before the incident is, however, available online. The audio recording of the call, uh, the live call with the police officers to the operator, is also available online. I encourage you to listen. Viewer discretion advised, it is pretty frightening. Why did the officer decide to enter? knowing the police's past history with Miss Lyles. She had threatened other officers and in the June 5th statement had also made some rather mentally disturbing exclamations that she and her daughter would transform into a wolf. And then later, in the June 18th incident, uh, she told the officers that y'all had better be ready or get ready uh, calling them a bad word I won't say on YouTube. Now, it's a little disturbing that the police officers would still enter given the prior history, but we understand why they did. Our officers have a duty to protect people regardless of their prior relationships with the police. Even though they had a dangerous altercation with her before, they still were there to help her in her time of trouble. Now, this did not end well 
for anyone involved, especially her four children, who are left now without a mother. And there's a deep regret that the entire city feels for her loss. It would be better if we could make mental health services available and more accessible to everyone around Seattle to prevent situations like this from ever occurring again. It would be better if we could make sure our police are using less lethal takedown options in close to mid-range incidents. It would be better if we were able to get video recording of incidents via police body cam. These are beliefs that I strongly hold. Now, regarding my second topic, is the changeover a lot of people are feeling from single-family housing to multifamily housing here in Seattle. There is a huge debate over how Seattle should grow. A lot of people want to protect the neighborhoods they have the way they are. Sadly, as the fastest growing city in Seattle, sorry, Seattle, in the United States, we have a responsibility to house everyone that wants to live and work here. Now, we cannot do that with single-family housing. There's not enough plots available in the city. Outside of the city, sure, and a lot of Seattle residents are being forced by increasing rent to leave the city they live in or they work in, and that's rather unfortunate. I am a huge proponent for multifamily housing, large apartment buildings, tall structures. We need to be building up with limited spaces and not out. It doesn't really work. Single-family housing is not actually a good thing for these growing populations. It's not fun to move from a house to an apartment, I understand, but it's one of the realities for large cities. Cities around the world, from Moscow to Tokyo to New York, inside of their city limits you won't see many single-family homes. We need to be condensed, but well-protected and well spaced out. We'd like to have some personal space, not just $750, 400 square feet apartments, which you can probably find all around Seattle with a quick search on apartments or Zillow. We would like to have some real efficient space, but also to have enough space to comfortably live in. We do have to make apartments big apartments. I know a lot of you aren't going to be happy with this change. But the fact of the matter is, we cannot sustain single-family housing in a growing city of this size. If we were a more sprawling city, like Los Angeles, it could be possible, but we are not. We must have apartments, we must have high-rises, and we must have density. We have to develop for that density, too. We have to support more simplistic and not as architecturally wild designs to maximize the space that we have available to us. We have to make sure our transit and business opportunities are available for the new residents. We have to make sure that we help the city zone properly. Now, it's up to each neighborhood, really. Every neighborhood has a different vibe, a different history, a different culture. I'd like to restore the funding to the neighborhood councils. They really can help decide what's proper zoning. As long as they know that we do have to zone up, the question is how high. Now, at the bottom of the description, you'll see a link to my Twitter page, I underscore Affleck underscore Ash, A-S-C-H, and my email, Ian A-A, for Seattle City Council at gmail.com. I'm sorry, it's ENAA for City Council at gmail.com. Please send me any questions you have. I'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. Tomorrow at noon, I'll be hosting a live video chat 
on Google Hangouts if possible. If not, I will give you an update that this won't happen. Please watch my videos. I know it's corny to ask, but I've got a lot to tell you. I've got a lot to talk about. And I'd love to hear what you have to think. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great day. The previous video message was sponsored by Ian Affleck Ash for City Council. Thank you.